my name is Adrian Dan, and on behalf of the ASMBS, the Bariatric Surgical Training Committee, and my co-moderators, I'd like to welcome you to the special edition of the Fellows Project Series. Joining me this morning, as always, are Dr. Kenor Jane Spangler, and the West Coast session will be hosted by Dr. Judy Chen and the chair of our committee, Dr. Matt Martin. So every first Friday of each month, we bring together the world of bariatric surgical education for high quality didactics, and today is no exception. We like to keep this interactive and make it a uh, great experience for our fellows and our faculty, as well as anyone who wishes to join us. And as a reminder, please use the Q&A function of the Zoom app and enter your name and institution and questions. We will get to as many of the questions as possible, and there will be a separate live Q&A session for the West Coast to rebroadcast this afternoon. Uh, today, we have an excellent, um, an excellent uh, event set up for everyone, and we're going to start with Dr. Paul Severson. Um, Dr. Severson is the director of the Minnesota Reflux and Heartburn Center. He's also the program director of the Advanced GI MIS Bariatric and Flexible Endoscopy Fellowship at that institution. Dr. Severson, in addition to that, has a distinct passion for representing and supporting their fellows as they enter the job market a difficult thing to do these days. For that reason, he's here to impart um, some great knowledge and let us know what we need to know and do as we, as we venture out into the, into the job market search. In addition to that, we have an excellent, uh, an excellent uh, list of panelists. Um, and I will tell you as the, as the fellows, um, these folks are all leaders in the ASMBS and in our field and truly need no introduction. And we'd like to keep those introductions at a minimum in the interest of time. We have Dr. Dr. Dan Jones, who's professor of surgery at Harvard and uh, vice chair of surgery at Beth Israel Dickinus. Medical Center in Boston. We have Dr. Rami Lutfi, who's a forgotten bariatric surgeon in private practice and also associate professor of surgery at the University of Illinois at Chicago. We have Dr. Colleen Kennedy, a minimally invasive and bariatric surgeon in private practice in Dallas and very much involved in the ASMBS as well as IFSA. Uh, we have Dr. Folhan Ayula, who's a medical director uh, for uh, weight loss specialists of North Texas and in private practice in that region. And also we have Dr. Lyndon Karras, who is a medical director of a bariatric care center in a rural region. And of course, uh, Dr. Corey McBride, who is a past chair of our committee and currently on the executive um, committee of the ASMBS from the University of Nebraska. So without further ado, I want to kick off this event and hand it over to Paul Severson, who will give us some excellent, excellent advice and impart the knowledge that we need to know as we embark on the job search. Paul, welcome. Thank you for your time, your expertise, and please take it from here. Uh, thank you, Adrian. It's a pleasure to speak with you all, and I want to thank the SMBS, <clears throat> the Fellows Project, as well as the Fellowship Council for allowing me this opportunity. So let me begin by sharing my screen. Um, a second here as I load it up. All right, I think we're all set to go. Can you see that, Adrian? We can see it perfectly, Paul, thank you. Excellent. So the title of the talk is, I'm a fellow and I need a job. Help me, please. I have a few disclosures. Um, I'm a faculty for Lynx, proctor speaker, consultant for a couple of companies, uh, Endogenics, uh, advisory board, and a consultant for Medtronic. And I've been on several other, with several other industry partners in the past as well. That'll come into play later on as we talk about uh, what you can do to, to um, uh, get an income. So uh, also for disclosures, <clears throat> I gave this presentation at the first ASMBS Fellowship Director's Summit. Um, some of it by request today is being represented to you. It's been updated to include the latest financial data, uh, the 2021 MGMA database. For those of you who are not familiar, that is the Medical Group Management Association. Every year, uh, the administrators from our hospitals submit data nationwide 
and entered into what turns out to be a very large book for every single specialty. And it's amazing how much data is there. And when you go to get a contract, your administrators, they usually know this data. They know what people get paid. And today's the purpose of today is to try to share a little bit with you so you have some understanding of what they know and what you don't. And I should say that any opinions that might be expressed by me today uh, may not represent those of the ASMBS or the Fellowship Council. And hopefully we'll hear some other opinions from the uh, elite uh, panelists that are joining me. All right, this was the opening slide. <laughs> Actually, it was structured as a debate between Dr. Adrian, Dan and myself at the Director's Summit. And it, what, a, what a great guy for asking me, his opponent, to come back and, uh, and talk to you about this. My job, this is what the title was, my fellow needs a job, their responsibility or mine. And I was assigned to mine. Well, why? Uh, and this was the slide I gave to the fellowship directors. Fellows really have no clue about the real world and desperately need our help in several key areas. And we will focus on that today. Four different topics. What are the practice type variations? What is the compensation that um, general and bariatric surgeons uh, receive? And what, what, how do we negotiate a contract? Uh, we cannot limit our mentorship to surgical procedures. Fellowship directors need to prepare our fellows for the real world by landing them in the real world. And we shouldn't entrust our fu their futures to search firms and attorneys. So let's talk about the practice types. There's basically three. Uh, the first and most dominant in today's uh, uh, medical world is the hospital employee. This is more difficult to negotiate a contract because you, you, you would be joining a very large healthcare system they tend to have uh, boilerplate contracts and basically you become an employee. Uh, it's not necessarily bad. You know, I mean, Minnesota, the Mayo Clinic has uh, treat their surgeons very well, but there's a potential loss of autonomy when you become a hospital employee. The second type of practice is a, is a PSA or a professional service agreement. Uh, I, I'm familiar with this because this is the model that I'm in. Uh, this can be very advantageous for high quality practices, maybe not quite so good for uh, initial or low quality practices. And um, we'll go into that in a little more detail later. But um, the, the third category is private practice. I was in private practice for the majority of my life, but this is becoming increasingly rare. Uh, some cautions regarding private practice, and uh, hopefully we'll hear from our panel about the successful ones. But, you know, I've had fellows go into all three different models in the past. And uh, the cautions that I would throw out there are there's a buy-in structure usually, which means that fellows who, particularly those who have high debt loads, may struggle trying to come up with additional uh, loans, basically. Uh, this requires a business analysis. Uh, you don't want to get into a private practice because it's a business unless you able to do some sort of a business analysis. Uh, there are tremendous opportunities out there. For example, ambulatory surgery center ownership, et cetera. You can really uh, do quite well financially in some of these setups. The fellow, I think, should strongly desire the location and the practice because you do end up with financial commitments and that'll keep you there. So that's an important concept to think about. And I, I do have a warning. I've seen this with some of my colleagues financial reward may become the dominant goal in life. And it may not be the reason why you went into medicine in the first place. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna talk about the employee model or the private practice model today, briefly about the PSA, because a lot of people don't know about that. Um, I have experience with that. Uh, the corporate, it's basically a corporation that's formed by a group of surgeons, or it could be any group of doctors and a contract with a healthcare system. Ideally for graduating fellows, it should be composed of only surgeons. I would caution people to avoid the multi-specialty group. And I, I, I'm not saying that you couldn't be successful in that, but my experience being in one is that the hardworking, highly compensated surgeons always lose. There's always seems to be a redistribution of income. It gets to be very, 
uh, difficult and it can cause personal relationships and a lot of hurt within the group as they fight about how to split up the money. The, the nice thing about it is you don't need to own any real estate. You don't have to manage any employees. So there's really no skills needed for business and you don't use up any time uh, running a business. Uh, powerful and productive groups that uh, of course have quite a bit of leverage over the healthcare system because the healthcare system needs that group to produce revenue for the healthcare system. So therefore it puts you in a good position to negotiate better contracts. Also, you can retain autonomy and the group can basically do whatever they want with, uh, with the um, requirements for whatever, for call or you name it. Um, the, uh, one of the great advantages of a PSA is retirement plans. And uh, in our group, we continue to attract very high quality surgeons because they're panicking when they're about 50 years of age because they don't have enough money to retire on. And the beautiful thing about being in an all surgeon group is, and you don't have a lot of employees, is you can really maximally fund retirement plans. <clears throat> and catch-up plans are particularly important for surgeons uh, because you start saving so late in life. So let's talk about the principles <clears throat> for compensation, first of all. I got two of them here, and I'm, I'm really passionate about this, and I'm actually I'm kind of upset about it because fellowship training demands increased compensation. You don't spend a year extra in your life becoming a specialist above a general surgeon and then have the same contract sent to you that a general surgeon receives. Not, that's not right. So um, fellowship training should also prepare you for a directorship. Directorships require leadership skills, team building, time commitments. They're required for accredited bariatric programs and probably advised for most other major programs within a hospital because they produce significant revenue for healthcare systems. And the person who runs it should be able to be compensated for the work that they're performing. And we'll talk about the fact that this is well-established and there's actual dollars assigned and you'll see how much money directors make. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you a series of tables and don't focus on any numbers here. I'm just going to show them to you because this is an example of a table, a snapshot of a table from the MGMA database. This is one that I showed two years ago or from 2019. We showed it last year. And uh, this is general surgery. This is just that particular specialty. Um, across the top of this, you can see it's divided up by East, Midwest, Southern, and Western. And it's got all of the financial data for this particular specialty. On the next one, this is the one from 2021, which I'm going to review with you now. And this, this is interesting because this is the 2020 data. So it, was, it occurred during the pandemic year, the majority of the year being in the pandemic. And we'll see what happened to surgeons in the country, contrasting general surgery to bariatric surgery. This is bariatric surgery. Uh, from two years ago and bariatric surgery from this year using 2020 data. This is a summary. Um, let me just minimize this so I can see it. Okay. Um, I'm going to use an arrow here to help guide you through. What I've done is I've synthesized all of this data, uh, which is pretty complex, taken out what I think is the key things for you to know, and I'm contrasting general with bariatric. So if we go to the top level here, general surgery, this is from Actually, this is 2019, it's a couple years ago, but I want you to try to remember these numbers and I'll contrast them on the next slide. In the East, and this is a difference regionally too, big differences regionally between, um, between uh, regions of the United States. In the East, we got 365,000 to the general surgeon, the Midwest 445, South 422, Western 414, for an average of $411,000 compensation. Now, this is total compensation provided by the healthcare system. So this would include the actual work, the RVUs that are assigned and then paid for the surgery and any other compensation that the hospital would pay. So if there were directorships included in this, for example, uh, call pay perhaps provided through the hospital, this would be included, total compensation. You'll notice that the bariatric surgeons in the next uh, red line, we've got the East, 
500,000, Midwest 600,000, South uh, almost 500, and West almost 500. For an average of 519,000, the difference being $108,000 as to what a general surgeon is paid and what a bariatric surgeon is paid. I wanna go back up though to see why they're paid more. This is the no dollars per RVU right here, okay? RVU meaning relative value units, the amount of work that you do. You can see that this is pretty, pretty even there's distribution differences, 62, 67, 57, 71. The average being $63 per RVU prior to the pandemic. You can see that the number of RVUs that a doc, the average surgeon generates in a year is about 6,500. And it's variable Southern, see in the South, they work harder down there. It's interesting, 6,500 RVUs being the average. Now let's go down to bariatric surgeon. Here's the difference. Bariatric surgeons get a lot more RVUs. You can see 78, 9,000, 7,500, 8,700, 8,253. Pretty big difference in terms of the RVUs generated. Now part of that might be because a bypass, for example, has a, a high number of RVUs assigned to that particular procedure. Um, if you're cranking out sleeve gastrectomies, you know, the RVUs go up. You'll notice that the RVUs really are the same for general surgeon, you know, dollars per RVU between general surgeons and bariatric surgeons is basically you're able to generate more RVUs as a bariatric surgeon. But the difference is here. This is what you focus on because if you're negotiating a contract, your, your contract better reflect the fact that your general surgery peers who didn't spend a year doing a fellowship should have this difference between you and them. It comes out to an average of $108,000. And admittedly, um, oh, I'm so proud. This is the Midwest folks right here. Okay, I'm right in the Midwest. See that? Uh, lead the nation. All right. So now let's click on to the next slide. Uh-oh, I'm not advancing. Let's try this. There we go. All right. This now is the data from uh, 2021 MGA, MA reflecting what happened in 2020. Very interesting. First of all, everybody went up despite the pandemic. The average salaries for general surgeon was 443, bariatric 567. Now the differences, whoop, the differences went up as well uh, to $124,000. Uh, Midwest bariatric surgeons topped out at 727,000 compared to their general surgical peers at 500,000, a big difference of uh, $230,000. RVUs down. RVUs went down about 500 for general surgeons during the pandemic year and uh, went uh, down about 1,000 RVUs for bariatric surgeons. Well, you say, well, how can they get paid more? Well, because hospital systems increased the RVU dollars per RVU a lot, like 15 to 20% across the country in order to keep surgeons whole. Uh, and you'll see here's down below, I've tabulated the differences with medians. You got um, now in the East, they took a hit because um, it, they were 135,000 ahead the bariatric surgeons a couple of years ago. And now they're only 61,000. Uh, this probably reflects their inability to do cases during that time. Uh, in the Midwest, uh, not so much. They still went up 154, $230,000 difference. And uh, and then of course in the South, they're not paid quite as much. Uh, actually, this is also the, due to the fact that the general surgeons generate more RVUs in the South. Uh, the West also went up um, from 74 to 107,000. Uh, if we, I took all quartiles, that means the 25th uh, quartile, the median, the 75th quartile, and the 90th is what they keep track of. And if you average all those, the difference between general and bari bariatric surgery is $140,000. Now, what about academic salaries? Well, they're a little bit less. And these are the numbers, uh, but the MGMA reports, uh, there's some missing data from the Midwest and the West on bariatric. But as you can see in the other two sections of the country, there's very little difference between the general surgeons and the bariatric surgeons in an academic practice. I, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to hear from some of our academic surgeons. Uh, you know, they can generate quite a bit of income outside of the typical RVU reimbursement system of the healthcare uh, organization. All right, we're going to move on now to medical directorship. These are tables taken from 
the latest 21, 2021 database comparing general surgical medical directorships and bariatric surgical directorships. And really, there's not much difference. So I basically just took the data. And you know what? I, because we want to share this here, I, I have to use the data from two years ago because directorships are paid by the hour. And the, the pandemic took a big hit on directorships. There was, a, in some areas of the country, 20, 25, 30% losses because they weren't at the hospital working. So uh, there was less paid. So I'm going to use the compensation pre-pandemic which should, I would think, in the next year or two, uh, come back up and maybe go higher yet. So the annual compensation for a medical director, and this is taken for uh, bariatric surgeons, would be between twenty-five and ninety-one thousand dollars extra added onto their income at the fiftieth and seventy-fifth percentile levels. I also am throwing in the ninetieth percentile levels for some of the big bariatric programs where you could be paid 100 to 165,000. The hourly compensation, which is in these books, uh, is 180 at the 50th percentile to 270 at the 75th percentile. And at the 90th, as much as 250 to $434 an hour. The average number of total hours worked in a week dedicated to your bariatric directorship will be between four and 10 at 50th and 70th percentile. And at the 90th, a lot of hours, 12 to 20. Now, there's wide variations by geographic location with the South being the lowest. So I took the annual median compensation for all these regions of the country. If you look at them with 38, 41, 53, and 65, the average should be about $50,000 extra added to your RVU income. So what should you have for a negotiation target if you're going to become a bariatric director, if you're fortunate enough? Well, you should be paid about $250 an hour. Uh, as an average, you should work six to eight hours a week uh, sustaining that department. Uh, you're usually going to be capped. A good cap would be about $80,000 in a year. Uh, they won't pay you beyond a certain amount uh, for the hours that are worked. If you do endoscopy in your practice, get this, you should add about $50 an hour on. Why? Because sadly, gastroenterology is rewarded across the board more than surgeons. All right, now on-call compensation. This is uh, what it shows us for the hourly rate. Uh, only the Midwest reported ac accurate data on this, but you can see that the average hourly rate for just being on call is 40 bucks an hour. Uh, it jumps at the 75th and 90th percentiles quite a bit. Let's see if we can explain that. So for example, in our practice, in a community practice, when we are on call, we only get, uh, we get a little less than $40 an hour and a 24 hour day you see would be paid $960. Assuming you're on call every fourth night and every fourth weekend, that would, that would give you an additional income of $87,600 uh, during a year. Now you say, well, how can it go up so much at 70? Well, a lot of hospitals don't have acute care surgeons and they have to pay surgeons to take call maybe at night or on the weekends, and they're going to have to pay them more than $40 an hour to do that if they're in a busy hospital. So therefore, they'll pay them the rates that you see would just be an assumption. If you got paid $137 an hour, a 24-hour day would be $3,300 to cover for a day, and a weekend call from Friday evening to Monday morning would uh, get you better than $8,000. All right, let's move on to retirement benefits. The median total benefits from our MGMA database, um, sadly, if you live in the East, I don't know how it can be that low. It's unbelievable that you'd only have $12,000 going into your retirement fund on an annual basis. Uh, Midwest, thirty-seven five, dollars South, uh, 25000 West, 30000 So what can you put in? Well, the IRS allows in a 401k, 19500 and then when you get a little bit older, you can do catch up. Uh, it's an extra $6,500. So right now it's $26,000. If you belong to a group that has all legal added pension and profit sharing options, you can uh, have a maximum of $47,000 in, in, in place. And you can see surgeons don't measure up on this. And if you belong to a large healthcare system, the, the, to the benefits have to be spread out among all employees. So they may not be willing to put a lot in because they have to pay everybody in the healthcare system and it has to be equitable. 
So this is where the PSA comes in. The PSA is able to add what's called a cash balance plan. And this allows large sum contributions. This can be up to 25% of the surgeon's income. And it can be $250,000, uh, for example, could be uh, deposited to an older surgeon in a subspecialty. There are, there's tiering uh, in this, actually. You can't put as much in when you're younger. Uh, this was put in place many years ago by the government as a defined benefit plan. It is a true pension plan. So it's actually owned by the PSA, not by you, the individual. That can be scary for certain people. Say, what happens if the PSA goes down or whatever? Well, it, there's some risk to it because you have to have a strong PSA. Uh, the investments are carefully managed. They have to be very safe because the PSA cannot afford to not be able to pay a retiring surgeon. The usual target is 4%. Uh, now, when you retire, you can take all of your money that's been saved in the PSA for you out in one lump sum. You can take it out over five years. You can take it out over 10 years, or you could take it out as a monthly pension uh, long-term. All right. Let's move on to contracts. This is widely variable geographic regions, state to state, large healthcare systems versus independent hospitals and practices. But I can tell you one thing, it's uniformly disappointing. Why is that? Well, because when you start talking to your colleagues who have other specialties, who may not have even put as many years of training as you have, uh, you're gonna find out you're paid less. And that's because general surgeons, uh, sad to say, I have been one of them, except the lowest compensation of all surgical specialists. Furthermore, and this is most disappointing and should be to our program directors, that fellowship trained general surgeons frequently accept a general surgeon contract without any negotiation. Please, if you're listening today, you can't let that happen. We got to change that. The fellowship directors who allow this to happen just ensure their own future poor compensation. Contracts are designed by attorneys who represent healthcare systems. This places you, the fellow, at a disadvantage. Fellows need assistance from their program directors, but not all program, it's not their fault, but not all program directors may not have the expertise to provide advice or help negotiate. That's why we're talking about it with you today. Let's talk about uh, how a contract could be modified and what points you need to make when you're looking at that contract and uh, trying to improve it. First of all, there's usually a guaranteed salary, but you can always add on a bonus for productivity. You know, hospitals want you to be productive. So let's say that you uh, produce more than six or 7,000 RVUs a, in a year. Um, if you're busy, you should be rewarded for that. So there's uh, frequently bonuses that can be added on for that productivity based on your RVU production. Signing bonuses. Signing bonuses are usually not that great in places that don't need surgeons and places that need them uh, frequently will give a, a, a sizable signing bonus. And I'm telling you, they could be almost nothing to $200,000. Uh, this is structured. It, why could it be so much? Well, because it's structured as a forgivable loan. So they basically give you a loan, but you need to stay with the organization for several years to achieve forgiveness of that loan. If you leave because you don't like it after a year, you're gonna to have to pay most of it or potentially all of it, depending on the contract back. Directorships, we talked about that. You have to set the cap for the annual salary. You gotta negotiate the hourly rate. Healthcare systems fund developments of new technologies and service lines. Many of you are going, are going to go into um, practices where you need to get something going. You need to get a bariatric program or maybe a foregut program going. And you're gonna need commitments in writing. This is very important for acquisition of these new technology service lines, which may include personnel to help you. If you don't have that, I guarantee you, you will be frustrated and you will be leaving looking for a new job. So it's very important that you nail that down first. I also uh, advise you to look into including memberships to various societies. These are getting expensive. Um, extra paid time off to go to meetings. Hospitals should be paying you to improve the quality of care within that hospital. You lose RVUs when you leave, they need to pay it. 
but a lot of hospitals don't do this. This is why a lot of our meeting attendance is falling off in the United States. Uh, travel privileges, uh, you know, I get those, I argue for them and they give them to me. I prove to the hospital how, how valuable it is for me to come back with valuable educational material that will improve the quality of care in our hospital. I also argue for an education budget for the department. I want all my team to be able to be well-educated, to be on top of their game. That takes money. Uh, I get $10,000 each year to be able to use uh, by my discretion for the Department for Educational Reasons. What about loan forgiveness? Well, uh, some, this is big for a lot of the fellows that are so much in debt. This is also structured as a forgivable loan, much like the signing bonus. And uh, some programs that need you a lot will uh, have this as a feature. What about moving expenses? That's routine. Everybody's got to pay for moving expenses. And uh, that is, um, it, it's a, usually a fairly small amount, you know, $10,000, $20,000, something like that. But usually that's covered. CME allowance, uh, personally, this really um, does not, uh, I, don't, I don't like it because CMEs are going down. As I talked to my colleagues, they've been, uh, healthcare system been chiseling from the usual 5,000 a few years ago. It's I'm, sometimes it's 2,000 or 1,000. I don't understand it. The only thing that really drives quality is getting uh, doctors to do a better job. And if they don't get good CME, how in the world is that gonna happen? So really you have to help argue with your healthcare system to uh, keep the CME allowance high. Uh, call pay, this is difficult to negotiate. It's usually predetermined. Uh, healthcare systems either have it or they don't. But if you're going to a community practice and they need you, and particularly in rural locations, they'll uh, very readily pay call. Finally, I want to talk about intellectual property. This is really important to preserve your future rights. So intellectual property is um, something where you can really increase your income over a lifetime. Large healthcare systems try to own the surgeon's intellectual property. What I mean by that is, let's say you work for Google or Apple or some really, there's no way that your invention is going to be yours. That's going to be owned by the company. Uh, likewise, if you join a massive uh, healthcare organization, uh, you work for them as an employee and they own everything that you do pretty much. That's not great because there's a lot of income that could come from some uh, pra outside of practice duties that could be allowed. And these are the classic uh, carve outs that you could uh, make additional income on your own outside of your practice duties. Teaching compensations, industry compensations, inventions and patents, medical legal work, consultant to healthcare systems and insurance companies, research related compensation, publication royalties. Substantial auxiliary income is possible if you are able to retain your intellectual property. Uh, this is to the program directors, the negotiation phase. One, invite your fellow to share all their contracts for your review. Go through the initial contract offer, identify all deficiencies, discuss the, weak, the contract's weak and strong points with the fellow, and then set up a virtual negotiation conference. I kind of act as my fellow's agent. A lot of times they don't like that, but... Um, I've been around the block and I'm listening to what they're doing, trying to attract the fellow. And, you know, they deserve this. Our fellows are first round draft choices. They need a great contract. And I hope that I can be there to help them get it. So, and then the final step that a lot of programs don't do, but we try to get every year is I really want their prospective hospital to come visit. I want them to know what their special training and a fellowship did for them. I want the prospective hospital to understand how, lucrative they can become, how, how successful they can become if they invest in the fellow's specialty by getting the technologies that are necessary for them to be successful and understand that it takes money to make money. So the site visit is a very powerful tool, strongly recommended. And finally, uh, to our program directors, our fellows are like family. They're our pride and our joy. So go the extra mile, help your fellow get a great job. I love this quote from Winston Churchill. So I just don't talk about money. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Thank you. Dr. Severson, enlightening and fantastic lecture. Um, we'll get back to you with some questions, but I do want to hand it over to Dr. Jane Spangler 
to um, get some um, some thoughts from our panelists. Thank you so much for that amazing lecture. Um, people have already put in the chat, you know, I wish that I had this when I was a fellow and that was the whole point. So thank you so much for that. Um, and we do have a panel full of so many lived experiences. I kind of want to go around the table here um, and get some perspectives on things. Dr. Lutfi, we'd like to start with you. Um, can you give us just a couple minutes on, on what life is like in private practice um, and the three hardest things about your practice now? Yeah, uh, life in private practice. You sure only two minutes? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I mean, uh, I mean, interesting. Uh, we're very academic, private practice. We have a fellowship presidents, um, but uh, uh, in just in a nutshell, uh, what I like about private practice, I own the practice, and uh, we we have a financial partnership structure. And the nice thing is, there is no boss. We make the decision, um, which is good and also bad. You know, COVID. Uh, was a very, very difficult time because there is no guidance and we had to figure it out and read all these things, fill the PPP loans. And uh, I looked up at uh, bankruptcy uh, at some point and I still getting those things on my phone uh, uh, because you know the threat in private practice is there, but also the financial rewards are there. Uh, Paul um, was very elegant uh, talking about uh, extra income from hospitals, you have to really uh, understand that you're valuable to your hospital. And not only you make money by your hands when you operate, but you make money um, uh, with your brain uh, by building what's going to be center of excellence and so forth. A, um, uh, you can be also uh, academic in private practice and get the pleasure of uh, publishing, growing, teaching. So I think private practice uh, that that is purely private um, is gonna is starting to go down unless you uh, uh, generate additional income in ambulatory surgery surgery centers um, uh, ancillary revenue like doing your own twenty four pH manometry sleep study but to have just pure private practice without any additional income and just make your income by RVU, by RVU, RVU, because we don't get paid by RVU, we get paid by insurance, is impossible. And I'll close that um, uh, so we can move on quickly to educate those who are younger to give examples. So um, Dr. Severson talked about RVUs. If you are in private practice and you are getting paid for what you do yourself, it's your practice, uh, RVUs don't matter. Let me let me explain that. So I can make more money. I have a colorectal uh, surgeon, uh, uh, hemorrhoid, Blue Cross Blue Shield, or good insurance, hemorrhoidectomy will pay more than Medicaid sleeve gastrectomy. So uh, uh, so while we it's good to look at RVUs uh, for private practice, really that insurance is what's going to matter, not the RVU. I have no idea how many RVUs I do per year. I've been in private practice for 16 years, and I just get paid uh, per insurance. So we just have to be a little bit careful um, that our views are very different uh, between different insurance companies. Those are fantastic points. I think you probably just blew some fellows' minds, um, but really good things to talk about. I'm going to move on here to Dr. Jones. Um, Dr. Jones is professor of surgery at Harvard, and a very strong academician. We would love for you to tell us a little bit of the same. So favorite things about academics and, and maybe the hardest parts. And in addition, if you could tell us a little bit um, briefly about how what we consider academic surgery has changed over the last decade or so. And then finally, there are some inquiring minds out there who want to know what does a fellow need to do to get an academic surgical job? Well, there's a lot of questions in that one. So you, if, if, if I don't cover them, please come back to it. I, I think when you think about academic surgeons, uh, I mean, never in my career have I ever thought uh, I could make more money by, by doing a hemorrhoid. Um, so that just never comes up, right? Um, what I'm interested in as an academic surgeon is the education, the mission, right? Uh, we're teaching medical students, residents, fellows. We're looking for research and discovery. Um, for a lot of us, uh, we really enjoy travel and, and meeting colleagues in different parts of the world. Um, 
but uh, but never can I tell you how much I could make for a hemorrhoid or a sleeve or, or something like that. Now we, we, we do have to be responsible, all right? We have to we have to make budget and we need to bring in income and bill for our services. But you know, for the most part in academic surgery, uh, we're not worried about who has good insurance and who has bad insurance. We just want to get them in and, and take care of them, and, and that's a a stressor that that I don't have to, to worry about that I know the private practice guys who have a rent and things are very worried about. Now, in terms of models in academic surgery, there, there, there are lots of them, right? You, you have your hubs, you have your spokes, you have your A programs, B programs. Um, they're all run under different financial models, different levels of involvement by the hospital or the academic centers uh, paying those salaries. So um, you know, if you've been to one academic center, you've been to one academic center, and, and even those facilities are going to have different relationships uh, at each of the sites. Um, you know, the, what are the pillars? I mean, the pillars of, of academic surgery have never changed, right? It's, it's, it's research. Uh, um, so, you know, it's, it's the clinical care, is research discovery, uh, teaching, all these things encompass what an academic does. And yet, individuals on the team will have different strengths, right? Some folks will be more of this and less of the other. Uh, when we talk about, you know, what do the fellows need to know who want an academic job? Well, there's not many academic jobs out there. Uh, they're coveted. Uh, there's, there's not that many. Um, so that's number one. Uh, so you need to prepare. How would you prepare? The advice I give the fellows are first, you know, find your surgical home. You know, if you're a bariatric surgeon, that's going to be ASMBS. Uh, if you're doing MIS, it may be SAGES. If you're doing surgical education, it's going to be ASE. Um, and, and so you want to join these organizations or all of those organizations if they're areas of your interest where you may be um, developing yourself. This is where you're going to find out about jobs. This is where you're going to find out about networking. Uh, this is like today, you're going to find out, you know, what does a doctor make? Um, you're not going to find that outside your surgical home. Two, uh, you know, during your training, uh, if you haven't done so now, now's the time to get really, really good at what you do. And that part of that is the technical skill, right? Um, so just like an athlete goes running or goes to the gym every day, um, you know, as a fellow, you really need to get the habit of going to the skills lab, practicing your suturing, uh, really challenging yourself on your anastomotic skills. I think uh, a lot of this, just like for athletes, can be done off, you know, not on game day. And, and that's where you go from being good to being great. And, and uh, if you want to challenge yourself, think about doing the Top Gun competition with Coach Rosser. Uh, get your nuts down to 25, 30 seconds. I mean, just really push yourself technically to be better than when you started. Uh, research. Um, you need to get involved in research. If you want to do academics, you may not want to go to a fellowship where they're, they're doing 600 cases, right? Uh, you need a place where you're doing fewer cases and have more time to reflect, figure out how to do a grant, how to write a paper, how to get abstracts out. Uh, now's the time to sort of develop some re basic surgical research skills. Uh, you may need to do more later, but now you start to fill out your CV. Um, look for education opportunities again. A couple less cases and more time teaching the residents suturing or teaching them robotics or uh, doing mock orals for the residents. I mean, these are the things that you're going to want to put on your CV that shows that you have a genuine interest in education in addition to your clinical interests. So look for those opportunities. And when it comes to looking at jobs, you can't start early enough. I think as you begin to graduate and you, you sign up, you know you have a fellowship. Uh, that's a good time to think about a research project, apply for grants, for the ASMBS, SAGES, and others. Um, that's the time to start asking your own program, hey, do you need somebody a year from now? When you go to a fellowship and you're interviewing, see if they have room to hire people on, um, you know, and start looking for that job on the early end um, rather than later. And that would be the advice I would get to say, look, academic surgery is a hell of a lot of fun. Um, and uh, we don't have to do hemorrhoids as bariatric surgeons. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's such excellent advice. Um, I'm going to move on real quickly to Dr. Kennedy. Um, Dr. Kennedy, I know you've had some struggles with um, non-compete issues, and we were hoping that you could specifically provide some advice um, to our colleagues entering our workforce who maybe are not so familiar with some of the pitfalls. 
Yes, good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, I actually am in private practice in Dallas, Texas, and I had joined a group when I moved to Dallas from New Orleans um, who had a non-compete in my contract. And I quickly saw within a year, actually, that the group was not for me and planned on leaving the group and left. And I had a non-compete. And everyone will tell you that non-competes are not enforceable. I will tell you after a year in court, lawsuits and sheriffs showing up at my office to shut me down, that non-competes are absolutely enforceable. So um, when you are looking at contracts, and it's typically in private practice, and in Dallas, it is a highly competitive area. So there is a lot of strict contracts written. Uh, if there is a non-compete in, then you better plan on being with that practice for a while. Now, in the world of bariatrics, there's a lot of us. So the fact that contracts have non-competes, I personally do not believe we should have them anymore. I hired somebody from my group that did not put a non-compete in because I knew that people come to see me for me. And so if somebody left me, they wouldn't really be hurting my business. Private practice physicians will want to put one in because they want you to leave if you leave their practice. Uh, all non-competes will have things saying it is based on blah, blah, blah. And they have a list of 10 things. Um, and they're supposed to have to enforce that to enforce a non-compete. It is expensive to fight them. It is difficult. If you are in a city and you have a non-compete for 10 miles, that pretty much takes out the entire city. Um, I am lucky. I fought mine. I stayed in town. I've been in here 15 years in private practice. Uh, still standing. There was seven surgeons before me that left my group, and none of them actually beat the non-compete. So be very careful when looking at contracts. If some of the larger centers and academics will have non-competes, and I can't speak to those, but I can tell you in private practice, you have to negotiate away from them. Thank you so much. Uh, I definitely think this is something that we need to um, educate our fellows on. And also I recently um, heard of some fellowships that have non-competes. Uh, so something else just to add on to the stress burden. Uh, we'll move on to Dr. Falahan Ayula. Uh, Dr. Ayula is also in private practice and I, I've known Fulahan for quite a few years now. We did residency together, went through fellowship at the same time. And Fulahan went through a very interesting experience, uh, fellowship and starting his first uh, real job. So I wanted him to talk a little bit about his baptism by fire and some of the things that he learned um, in uh, buying a practice. <laughs> Thank you for that, Kanoor. Um, uh, glad to join everybody. It's such a distinguished uh, panel uh, of people here. Um, well, I I'm uh, here in Dallas as well, private practice. I uh, did my fellowship in Richmond, Virginia, and um, joined a, a, a surgeon in the area here that was well known. Um, and I plan to stick with that practice. I really liked the way things were set up there. And a year into uh, uh, taking that job, he suddenly passed away. Um, I literally talked to him, I think, uh, Saturday evening, talking about cases on Monday and about 2 a.m. on Monday, I got a phone call that he had, uh, been found down and, and, and had died. Um, so at that point, um, I'm out in practice and I have no idea about anything. Um, I don't know how the staff is getting paid. I don't know how we're billing. I have no idea of contracts with insurance. Um, at that point, all I had had to do was show up and operate, which I knew how to do, but the rest of it was a mystery. And so it was basically a crash course in you better figure it out, figure it out quickly. Um, I ended up buying the practice Um you know, in private practice, especially in Dallas, there was an out-of-network model, in-network model. And when I had joined, I was out of network with all the insurances by intent. And so I had to get in-network and I had to do so very quickly to continue to operate. Um, so uh, for all the fellows that are watching this, um, uh, the best way to not find yourself in the position I was in was first you know, I don't know how you prevent your partner from all of a sudden passing away, but uh, at least know what's required to run private practice. Um, don't expect that the situation you're in is going to continue. So wherever you go, whatever you do, learn the business side, learn the business side of where you're at, because you never know when things will change 
uh, without, you know, following your perfectly laid out plan. Um, I think one of the things that did help me was I was surrounded by some really good people um, that really gave me the crash course I needed. I reached out to a lot of people I call Kanor. Kanor, like, okay, well, you know about this. <laughs> um, and so to take advantage of uh, the people around you that, that do want to see you succeed so you could uh, get educated. So I think the, the, the take home for me is, is don't wait till you know, you're put in that kind of position, just start learning this stuff now. So anyone that is watching this, you're already on the right track. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we're gonna get a, hopefully a perspective into people who want to practice rural surgery. So Dr. Ferris, you're doing um, more rural surgery. And um, if you could tell us the things that are great about that and some of the difficulties and for people who are interested in it, how do they, how do they find a job like yours? So um, thanks for having me. Um, so I'll start with the pros because I think we got to always start on the high note. Um, one of the things I love most about my job is that um, <clears throat> I've been able to really create a, a very special community of bariatric patients um, where four years ago, I was recruited to start a bariatric surgery program halfway between Cleveland and Columbus in Ohio. And this was a really a very underserved area in terms of bariatric surgery. Um, the only people getting bariatric surgery uh, in my area were people who um, could afford to uh, take the time and had the resources to travel to Cleveland or Columbus or Akron to get, uh, to get this surgery. And then the follow-up was a, cha a, a big challenge for them. Uh, and so in coming here and creating this program, you know, we have a online Facebook support group. Prior to COVID, we had a um, in-person support group that had 40 to 80 people in attendance every month. Um, and we have been able to put a lot of special programming in place. <clears throat> and I love it when somebody I operated on two years ago comes to the hospital on the day of surgery to support somebody who's having surgery that day. And they met in support, they met in this really unique community that we've created. Um, and so I think uh, <clears throat> some of the pros and cons are the same. I, I gave a presentation, presentation about this um, last year and uh, you will see your patients in the grocery store. You will see your patients at the gym. I kind of love it, but you it is something that you need to, be okay with being living in the same community as, as your patient population. And I think it's great, but, um, that's definitely something to take into consideration <clears throat> as far as the, um, cons go. Um, most small rural hospitals don't necessarily have the same resources as what you are used to in your training. You know, I trained at a big tertiary uh, medical center, academic center in a, in a city. I, even my residency, which was in a community program, but still in a city that had things like um, a cath lab and um, interventional radiology on call 24 hours a day. Um, if you're going to be in a rural center, there's a good chance you're not going to have all of those resources. Um, and so you're going to kind of have to figure out how to one, I guess, accept your limitations just because you can do the case does not mean that your um, colleagues and, the, and the, the hospital that you're in can support that kind of surgical case. Um, and, and just know your resources and know your limitations and realize that these things um, change. So, you know, when I first started in practice, one of my general surgery partners told me, if you have an active GI bleed, um, you know, somebody who's really, truly hemorrhaging, uh, you need to transfer them because we don't have access to that much blood that fast. But in the past couple of years, we opened, uh, two cath labs in two of our three hospitals and for to have a cath lab, you have to have the blood. So now we have the ability to deal with that thing that those, you know, active hemorrhage kind of situations better than we did when I started. So know what your resources are and know, and be aware that they change with time. 
um, and how to go about looking for one. Uh, three, you may be in a situation that I was where you're going to start a program because um, there are not a huge number of, of, of rural um, bariatric programs. We do, if it's something you're interested in, um, ASMBS does have a rural surgery committee um, and uh, I participate in that. And there's a lot of really amazing docs on this committee um, in really kind of all um, types of practice. There are, are academic, there's private, um, there's employed physician uh, <clears throat> docs in all of these in rural settings. Um, so that would be one place to look. Um, and then the other one is if you think you want to be in a rural practice, use your fellowship time um, to figure out the nuts and bolts of behind the scenes, how to run a bariatric practice, how to start a program. Because you'll more unless you climb on board with one of us who's already established, more than likely you're going somewhere and you're starting your own program. And um, there's a lot of stuff like how to coordinate a self-pay price and what kind of staffing you're going to need to make this happen um, that you need to prepare for because they, the hospital has no idea. They're hiring you and having you run the show and you need to come in competent and confident that this is what I need. This is the recipe for success. You know, my goal is to get MBSA Cup accreditation you know, within the first two to three years. Um, and that's kind of the, so I spent a lot of time in my fellowship, um, you know, with the nurse navigators, with the compensation people, with the um, edu nurse educators um, and the schedulers, figuring out how they did all their jobs so that I could bring all of that to my new job. Thank you so much. That sounds like a lot of work, but certainly sounds extremely rewarding too. Uh, I do want to quickly go around. We had one question about malpractice. So I'm just going to um, call on you each individually. If you can, one of the fellows was wondering, you know, how do you, how does malpractice work in your job situation? So Dr. Lutby. Yeah. Uh, well, malpractice in, uh, I will tell you two weeks ago, uh, malpractice in Cook County went up by 18%. We got a, we got a call and uh, it went up by uh, uh, by 18 percent. So again, in private practice, it's a budget. Uh, this is what I was trying uh, to say. Uh, Dr. Jones in academic probably you know uh, is in a different world, but uh, in private practice, it's like uh, running your house. It what comes in and what comes out. So um, uh, my practice is a big big deal. I practice in the worst area for liability in the country, Cook County in Chicago. Uh, but uh, I, so I just saw the question and uh, different contract, different thing. But in my practice, my uh, uh, in private practice, my friend, uh, like I said, you're going to collect and then you're going to get the, the quarterly a, uh, statement from your my practice company and you're going to pay it. And every time you get sued, uh, it's going to go up just like car insurance. Uh, so uh, nothing is steady. So it's in your in your practice, and I'm assuming Drs. Kennedy and Iola, it's also the same for you all that you purchase your own malpractice, you get a quarterly statement, you pay it, um, and with if there is a claim, then that goes up. Does it ever go down? Never. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yes oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Lutfi. Uh, sorry, I just want so we don't depress uh, uh, <laughs> uh, everyone. It doesn't. Go, uh, it doesn't really go down. That's simply. But um, yes, th there are years without a claim yes. um, that uh, you start going down. So I just hit fifteen years, and I don't have a claim. So my malpractice went down. So the overall uh, uh, went up by you know eighteen to twenty percent. But uh, uh, when I hit fifteen years, it did go down significantly. Number two, uh, when you do all these safety modules. Um, by your insurance, uh, malpractice insurance carrier, you, uh, 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 your fee does go down. And lastly, uh, all re respectable uh, um, carriers, uh, they come and look at your office. They, they look at uh, everything in the office. They look at medical record. They audit you. And if you pass that once a year, it does go down as well. Awesome. 
I do know we're right at eight o'clock. We're going to go over a few minutes, just a reminder to everybody that this is recorded. So um, if you do have to go, you can always look at it again on the ASMBS website. It is archived there. Uh, Dr. Severson, how does malpractice work for you? Well, first of all, it is hugely variable uh, state by state. Uh, around the country, there's different companies that are the insurers and their success, relative success is different from place to place. Uh, Minnesota happens to be a very low um, malpractice state. We have very high quality uh, attorneys who are very good at defense. Uh, this is again, variable from state to state. We also have a physician owned malpractice exchange, which has been in place for a long time. So I, I pay less than $10,000, you know, in the state of Minnesota, which I, I can see Dr. Lutte is just kind of laughing, you know, he's in Cook <laughs> County and it's totally different. It depends if you're in Florida. Uh, sometimes I'll, I, I don't know, Dan can speak about the East coast perhaps, but it, it's so variable. Furthermore, I don't pay it in a PSA. We negotiated because it's fairly low uh, we negotiated with when we got our initial contract, say, look, we're not going to pay the malpractice. The hospital is going to pick up that expense. And so it's not part of uh, what we have to worry about. Thank you. Dr. Jones. Yeah, I think the key thing is it varies widely. Uh, when I was in uh, Dallas, Texas, UT Health, I think they covered $200,000 on a claim. I mean, it was ridiculously low. Uh, they subsequently passed laws to make malpractice claims a little more difficult. In Boston, um, it's amazing. I mean, we have a great, great, great group of lawyers called Crico that cover all the Harvard hospitals. These guys are slick. They don't, they don't give up a penny. Uh, and therefore, it keeps the, the, the suits to a minimum because nobody wants to waste their time. Um, it, we're, I'm kind of, a, you know, each uh, department will get um, uh, billed a little differently depending on, on how many cases they have against them over periods of, you know, decades. Um, you know, the key thing about malpractice for anybody is, you know, does the coverage you have cover you when you leave, right? Uh, because that tail is real important to people who've moved jobs. And, you know, what that means is, you know, for me, if I move tomorrow, my insurance here at Harvard will cover me wherever I go uh, for events that occurred in Boston. But in some situations, if you move or change jobs or let go or something, that you may not have the coverage that you had when you were actually an employee. And Dr. Paris, how about you? So yeah, I, I have to echo Dr. Jones. Uh, tail coverage is extremely important. And I will tell you that everybody who gave me advice when I was negotiating my first contract told me that tail coverage was the most important thing I could negotiate into my contract. And um, to address, also addressing somebody else's contract question about boilerplate contracts, uh, changing my tail coverage was the only thing I was able to negotiate into my first contract to change from a boilerplate contract. Um, and that was because it, everybody told me it was most important to make sure that I had full tail coverage. Um, so even if I left, if, even if I left my job early, I still had full tail coverage for the time that I was there. Um, I'm an employed physician, so my hospital pays my uh, malpractice. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much they pay for it, um, but I do know that uh, about two and a half years into my practice, our malpractice insurance um, carrier did decide to increase our rates, uh, and they blamed it on uh, bariatric surgery, i.e. me, um, even though I had no claims. Um, and of course, my administration flipped out um, and came to me and said, well, what, what can you do so that you don't have complications? And I said, I don't know, not be a bariatric surgeon because <laughs> to, to put it mildly often enough, our patients are, are, are not in the, the best of health. So, you know, there's a lot of factors working against us. Um, I, my take on, on malpractice is that you, Listen, at some point in our careers, we're all going to get sued. Uh, it's not pleasant. Um, it's actually super painful, but um, you can't freak out about it. It takes years for this stuff to go through. And so to, to start panicking about it right away is um, not good for you and, and not healthy. And so 
it happens. Thank you for that. I'm gonna circle back to Dr. Severson and ask him, what do you tell uh, the hospital, the group in your negotiations? Well, they do tell you, look, this is our standard contract, take it or leave it. It's, it's what we have. <laughs> and well, also, well, not to cut you up, but when is the, the right time to bring up compensation? Obviously it probably wouldn't be in, your, in the first interview, but when is the right time to do that? Sure. Uh, yeah, of course, you want to uh, look like an all-star and you talk about money right away. That's probably not smart. So uh, do the do the interview first, uh, look like an attractive candidate. But when you finally get to the point where the contract arrives, uh, it could be a good day or a bad day for you because uh, <clears throat> I'll just take examples of recent fellows. You know, uh, if you move into a market, a hot market where surgeons really want to practice, uh, i.e. Denver or someplace like that that's really a, a great city and everybody's moving there, you know, you're not going to get a great contract. There's, they, they, there's so many people who want that job that uh, the healthcare organizations are kind of like, well, this is the way it is, you know, take it or leave it. So uh, if you move to a place where you're needed, they're going to bend over backwards. You're going to have a lot of uh, wiggle room on all of the uh, points that you want to make, uh, which I delineated. And you're not going to achieve all of them. You're just going to work on each one at a time. But um, the contracts will be highly variable. I can tell you that uh, contracts are embarrassingly low in some of these uh, sought after cities, like 250,000, starting at that, uh, up to about 500,000 for initial guaranteed contract. Um, but even in these systems, even in cities like Denver, uh, and there's a lot of them in the city, a lot of them around the country that are very desirable places to live. Um, you can still add features. You can always put a productivity uh, incentive, even if the uh, guaranteed salary is low. And don't focus on the guaranteed salary. That, as a bariatric surgeon, you know the amount of uh, income you're going to make over a lifetime is huge. Focus on the long term. What does the practice look like three, four, five, six years down the line? Not that first year. Everybody, I get it. When you're a fellow, you're so much in debt. You're getting paid next to nothing. Now, all of a sudden, you're making this huge. And you know what? 250 sounds like 500 when you're making 60. So uh, you, you have to focus on the health of that practice long term. Don't focus on the first year. If you really want to live in Denver, you're going to get a lower income initially. You need to look at what are these doctors actually making? And they should share that with you. If they don't want to open up and tell you what they're actually uh, allowed to make in year three, four, or five, and six, then I don't know. Maybe you should be looking at another job. Thank you, Paul. Um, we do have one last question before we wrap it up, and um, we're going to switch uh, roles here. Dr. Knorr Jane Spangler is going to become a panelist for a second. Um, and, you know, I do want to end on a high note, uh, Knorr. I do want to let everybody know, all the fellows, that bariatric surgery has a great future and there is tremendous opportunity. I think we're, we're in the early innings of, of what our specialty will, um, will become. But there, currently, there, there's, uh, there's some, uh, some difficulty finding these jobs. They're not as frequent as they used to be. The hospitals aren't rolling out the red carpets for people to start programs anymore because we have overtrained um, the number of uh, fellows that, that are um, becoming bariatric surgeons. So recently you've done some work uh, on that front. Can you share that with us? So sure, you know, the, the bariatric job market is kind of what we're talking about. And um, we did recently do a study identifying what the job market was like for current fellows, past fellows, um, and looking at how satisfied people really are with the jobs that they're getting. And it turns out that, you know, most, most of our graduating fellows are able to secure jobs, albeit not doing as much bariatric surgery as they want. So that's number one. Um, and number two, the other conclusion is that they're still happy. So they're doing more general surgery. Some are doing acute care surgery with some bariatrics and they're happy. But in the future, um, you know, this paper began as a brainchild between Dr. Yijin Chen and myself having a conversation about the job market and where are we headed. You know, revisional surgeries are growing at a rate faster than almost anything else. And we need to be training people with a skill set to do that. At the same time, sleeve gastrectomy is one of the 
um, you know, most popular surgery. So we need to have people who can do those as well. And um, how are we training? Who are we training? And where are we headed? And I think all of these are questions that ASMBS is starting to look at and, and delve into, especially with this, you know, focus practice designation that's coming up with the ACA, I mean, with the American Board of Surgery. Um, there are a lot of places that this is going to go. But for current fellows, I think what's important is when you're looking at a job, make sure that it is going to provide you uh, in one way or another happiness and satisfaction. And you're going to be able to reconcile with yourself that this is what you want to do every day. And if it seems like you might get pigeonholed uh, into a job that's not what you want, then it might not be the right thing for you. Thank you so much, Dr. James Penger. I'm going to wrap it up with that. I want to thank Dr. Severson and all of our panelists. This is tremendous. The number of, of uh, chat messages and other messages we received uh, thanking you and, um, and also from some of the panelists saying, gosh, I wish I would have had this one when I graduated. <laughs> uh, you guys are providing a great service to our fellows and we hope to see you all again. Uh, in the future, and of course, this afternoon at 3.45 Eastern Standard Time for the West Coast Q&A. Thank you all again, and we'll sign off. Okay, um, that was some fantastic discussion. Uh, hi, everyone. This is uh, Matt Martin. Uh, I'll be co-moderating this afternoon's session, and it looks like we have uh, some of our panelists uh, from this morning who are back for the afternoon. I see Dr. Karras, Dr. Jones, um, Dr. Kennedy, if, if you're there, uh, if you could turn your video on, and Dr. Severson, uh, and I also see Dr. Dan. So uh, please, for the uh, listeners, if you have any questions, submit them using the, the Q&A button. Um, there's Dr. Severson, great. Well, I'll start off with a uh, quick question uh, for, uh, for you, Dan. Uh, and, and Adrian, I don't know if you're able to chime in also. Uh, uh, Dr. Severson just showed us some pretty stark uh, differences between uh, academic and private practice salaries. So, uh, so Dan, do you wanna, wanna address that and, and how you're surviving on, on poverty wages as an academic bariatric surgeon? Well, my wife's laughing as you say that because I'm sitting on a boat on a beautiful <laughs> lake fishing for bass. So uh, it's been tough. But, but, uh, but I mean, the salaries are lower, uh, but obviously I think there's a bunch of other factors you need to consider. So, so, you know, what are, what are some of the other sure. factors that you think even out that difference? Yeah. So, I mean, the salaries are definitely lower on the starting end. Um, you know, if you progress to the academic ranks, by the time you're a full professor, uh, you're probably making pretty good money. Um, and compared to private practice on average, you're doing better. Um, you know, compared to the, the, the busiest practices, you're, you're making less, right? But then the question is, you're earning that money if you're, if you're, if you're working that hard and, and you may not have time to get out on the boat or, or enjoy it. You're, you know, very busy private practices are always worried about being gone and whether their, their referral structures will change. I got great partners who, uh, when I'm not there, are more than happy to take those cases. And, and as a team, um, we have a different approach. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Karras, any, any comment on the, uh, you know, the, the reimbursement levels and patterns for somebody who's going into a rural setting? Um, or so, I know sometimes they're better than, than you know, high demand areas. So, yeah, um, so actually that's a great question because I know in the early morning session, somebody asked um, <clears throat> kind of similarly, uh, you know, should we be expecting to get what these these MGMA average salaries or when we're fresh out do we expect to make less uh, and so um, to answer your question first I would say definitely um, in a rural setting you can often expect to be paid a little bit more I, I would say um, my I was a little bit surprised that my starting salary was as high as it was um, though I, I mean, I worked my butt off when I started this practice and, and, you know, the, the earning potential is absolutely there. Um, but I do think you do kind of, I, I don't want people to sell themselves short. There is obviously 
you know, going to be a little more room for more generous salaries if you're going to an area with less competition or that's potentially less desirable, like a rural setting. Um, whereas you might expect things to be a little bit lower in high con- highly populated areas and cities where there is a lot of competition. But don't sell yourself short that just because you're starting out, um, you should accept a lower salary than what what the av- what the average is. Um, that just just starting out doesn't mean anything. Um, I'll give you an example. I had a, a co fellow who joined a um, a private practice group um, in on the East Coast, and like by six months in, he was doing six or seven cases. Um, a day, two days a week. I took note of his surgical volumes because he joined this very busy group. And so for him to have taken a, a lower salary just because he was new would have been taking great advantage of him uh, because he was able to be productive very quickly. And I myself also would say, I bonused in my first year and I started a practice from nothing. So don't sell yourself short that you think just because you're starting or just because you're new, you can't. Okay. You don't have that same kind of earning potential that somebody more. Is. Sure. And that, that's fantastic advice. Um, hey, uh, that, Adrian, did you have something to say? Yeah. I just wanted to chime in. I'm on a bike ride. I just want to let Dr. Jones know that he's not the only one uh, enjoying this beautiful day and having a little fun. Uh, but and on a serious note, I do want to say that we've, we focused this morning and even today on, you know, the, the polar opposites and the extremes of, of the types of uh, employment models that exist. But there is a lot of in between. And uh, with that, Matt, I want to ask you a little bit about your, your situation, your employment model. And, you know, I'm certainly in a situation where I have the opportunity to trade in residence and be a fellowship director, participate in some research, but also also have that autonomy that maybe is not quite like the private practice folks, but, um, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly a nice in between best of both worlds. So what's, what's your employment model like out, out in San Diego? Sure. And, uh, and so, so I, I guess I, I had a kind of interesting change because I was a, a military bariatric surgeon for 15 years until I retired. So I was in what's essentially a communist system. I went then to a private group at a community hospital, although it was very much in the PSA model that Dr. Severson talked about. And I'm actually now, next week, starting a job at an academic medical center at uh, USC. Uh, and, and, and that salary issue is one that came up. So I, I'm going to be, my take home salary is going to be significantly lower at the academic center. Um, but you also need to factor in, uh, you know, I was funding my own retirement plan, funding my own malpractice insurance, my own disability life insurance. Um, there's tuition benefits at the new job for my kids. So, so even though it looks like I'm going to be making less, you know, when you factor those in, it's at least even. So, so there are a whole bunch of other factors at these jobs that you need to take in consideration. And particularly when we just say university jobs pay less that there are usually a lot of benefits at those jobs that I think are, are worth a a significant amount of money. I think we should pause for a second and really go around the room and say, you know, is it really the salary at this point? I mean, you're looking for a job in an area of the country you want to be in with people you want to work with, because you're going to be working with them a lot um, with a, you know, the patient population that you feel that you, you know, want to take care of and, you know, they're doing the work you want to do. I mean, Truthfully, the salary on the front end should be the least of your drivers, okay? And if we're not sending that message to you as a panel, we're probably making a mistake. But I'd like to hear what the rest of the panel says. Yeah. How about Dr. Kennedy, uh, if you're still on? Okay. I'm I, background. I'm I would say as solo practice, I all of my choice. Can you? Okay.
Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Kennedy, you're, you're breaking up. Um, but, but I, yeah. Sorry, we, we can't hear you. Uh, you're breaking up. Um, but, but I agree 100%, Dan, uh, my, when what I tell our residents and fellows, the, okay. the number, the number one, <laughs> sorry, the, the number one concern is for me is the group I'm going to be with. Never the, never the salary. Um, Dr. Severson, uh, I, I, I love what you said. Financial reward may become the dominant goal in life. Uh, and, and, and I've seen that toxicity, uh, you know, in some of the private practice uh, surgeons that I see where that does become the dominant goal. But what's your advice for how, how do you avoid that? You know, and if you do go into a private practice model where, you know, it's eat what you kill and, uh, you know, you're going to take on what you generate, but how, how do you uh, avoid that? And, and, you know, all the pitfalls that go along with that. Uh, Paul, can you, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're still on mute. Hey, Matt, since we can't hear Paul, I'll chime in real quick because in preparation for setting up this, uh, this event, we discussed this very topic. And I think the, the message that we need to send our fellows is that uh, money is important only as far as making sure that you're not being taken advantage of. I think we're all very lucky to, to do what we love to do for a living and to have the nice financial reward that comes with it. But at, at a point when that becomes your primary driver and uh, your primary motivation, um, it's really gonna lead to, to burnout if you don't enjoy what you're doing. And it's gonna be, a, I don't wanna say a long career, it's gonna be a long in terms of, of the, um, your ability to enjoy what, you're, what you do every day, but it's, it might actually be a short career because you're not going to be able to withstand the rigors and the stressors that come with what we do without enjoying the environment that you do it in. So money may seem like a good motivator, but in the long run, it, it really is not. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Adrian. And, uh, and Dr. Severson, I don't know if you were able to fix your mic, but if you are, you can chime in. Yeah, we looks like we still can't hear you. Um, what I'd like to do is is run through just each of the uh, panelists and just ask you. So you're you're talking to a, a fellow who's in the middle of their job search. They're looking at contracts, maybe about to sign. What what are just for, for each of you? Maybe give one of the common pitfalls or mistakes you see made that that can come back to really bite them uh, a little bit later uh, after they start that job. Um, and looks like Dr. Lutfi just joined us. Uh, do you want to start off, Rami? I'm not sure if you can hear us. Yes, I, I can. I was on mute. I'm uh, at the Illinois Association of Edge Surgery meeting, so um, I'm just walking away. So your question is about contracting. Can you very briefly tell me again what is it in contracting? Sorry about that. So, it, so it's, uh, you know, you're, you're advising one of your fellows who's in the middle of their job search and looking at contracts and maybe about to sign one. And, and just, I want each person to list what, what they would say is one of the top mistakes or, or errors they see made in that process that come back later on to uh, bite them. Well, what a great question. And the answer is very quick. I've given that talk. And, uh, and uh, I always say the biggest mistake is to, to flip through the pages to exhibit A and see how much the money uh, initially. Uh, I think a uh, residency, medical school, college, very long and very costly. And by the time people look for jobs, two things. Number one, they're broke. And number two, they're pretty ignorant about the world of business. Um, so uh, I, I believe uh, they're rightfully excited to finally get paid. And they flip through and they look at the money, at the bonus, they want to help their parents, their family. And uh, uh, my, my advice always is to do that. You know, salary is important. But the most important thing I would tell everyone on the call today is look where you're going to be at five and 10 years. Define what is happiness. Um, uh, uh, is it power? Is it fame? Is it money? Is it uh, research? 
and make sure this contract, your job, is going to get you there. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, the, the, uh, one of the biggest mistakes is not to have an exit strategy. So if I want to be in San Antonio, I have a decent contract. A, um, I, I, I like it. But it seems like if things don't work out, and it seems like, you know, the contract is benign and probably will work out. But if things don't work out, I may have a um, restriction to practice in San Antonio. So if things don't work out, I'm screwed. And my whole life wanted to build a practice in San Antonio. So uh, exit strategy is very, very important. And the third uh, most important thing is really uh, uh, what, what, what is this job? Who's going to help me? Uh, uh, what, what is every day going to look like? And uh, what, uh, many people just o o overlook that, getting stuck with intellectual property, uh, days of CME, and these other details. Because when we, when we give these contracts you know, uh, to, to the lawyers, lawyers don't think that way. Lawyers are going to think in this, you know, the language of the contract. You know, it's going to be back and forth. But you, as the person who's going to uh, uh, spend most of your life in that job, um, you want to you wanna know, what is, what is this job like? Who's around me? When I get in trouble, are these people going to be there? Are they getting along with the hospital, with the CEO? Do they like them? Do they not like them? Of course, talking about private practice. Uh, and I'm going to limit to that, so uh, I allow other people to. But this is just very briefly, these are kind of the most important things that come to mind. Great. Yeah, those are great. Uh, Dr. Karras, uh, your, your, your top mistake or uh, problem you see people in the job hunt or contract process? So it's a little hard and I'm kind of in an interesting position right now. I've, I've actually just uh, completely failed uh, to attempt to renegotiate my contract with my current employer. Uh, <laughs> so um, I, I will say that when I first signed the contract, signed my contract, when I first finished fellowship, um, the biggest piece of advice that I got was uh, to make sure that you had um, good tail coverage. Um, and that is the one, the one thing that I was actually able to negotiate a change in the boilerplate contract with my employer. Um, and so that kind of tags on to Dr. Luffy's, um, saying, have an exit strategy. Uh, you want to make sure that you, you, your malpractice will continue to be covered if you leave in a year or two, if you have to break your contract for some reason, because things aren't working out. Um, now going forward with my next <laughs> contract negotiation, it honestly, money is one of the least important things. Um, because my dad always used to say the money will come if you work hard. So that's, that's not the issue. Um, but now more, I'm looking at things that, um, make my practice run smooth, make my work life balance, uh, better, make my quality of, of life and my quality in <clears throat> in practice better um, and if you are like I did starting a new practice um, as opposed to joining an established one uh, the two big things I would tell you is ask for as much as you possibly can up front because it's a lot harder to get that extra staff member once you get busy and you realize you need that extra staff member than to get you know four people instead of three people up front when you're starting. Um, and then the second thing is, uh, oh gosh, and it just flew out of my head. <laughs> um, um, the, but but you, you actually hit on my top one of the tail coverage. So yeah. as, as I'm leaving this current position, just, to, and I know probably many people listening maybe never even heard of tail coverage. Uh, my, my tail coverage quote is sixty dollars to $80,000 for the tail coverage policy. And fortunately, my new job has agreed to pick that up. But that's, that's definitely something you want spelled out in your contract. And, and if at all possible, <laughs> the institution covering it, not you responsible for it. Right. Uh, looks like Dr. Severson is back. Uh, you're muted. Can you unmute? We'll see if you can hear. Yeah. Can you hear me oh, now? There we go. We, we were just talking about if you, if you have one one thing that you see that's a common mistake or problem for the 
the fellow who's in the job hunt or signing a contract, you know, what, what that would be and what your advice would be on how to avoid that. Yeah, I, you know, I think the thing that's frustrated me the most to trying to help the fellows is the fact that they, uh, the lack of recognition on the part of so many healthcare centers that the year of fellowship really does deserve additional reward uh, right off the bat uh, compared to uh, a general surgeon contract. So, so many of them bring me their contracts and they're just I said, this is a basic general surgery contract, doesn't recognize any of the contributions that you're about ready to make to this medical center. And, uh, you know, we can usually get that straightened out, you know, once, uh, once we, but I don't blame the healthcare centers, but if, the frustration is if, if, the, if the fellow doesn't know that they're worth more than someone who didn't put that extra year in, they're not gonna fight for, you know, the additional compensation. And I'm, I'm just hoping that we can, as fellowship directors, help support our fellows and let them know so that we can, we can bring our, our uh, levels of salaries up uh, across the country, you know, to equal some of uh, our other colleagues, many of whom don't spend as much time in training that we do. Sure. So I think that's the most frustrating thing for me. And, uh, uh, but I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to help the fellows get a much better contract by joining in with them on the uh, negotiation phase. Okay. Um, and uh, doc Dr. Kennedy, I don't know if you're able to, to unmute now and, and if we can hear you. Can you hear me better now? Oh, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, I'm in the middle of a rainstorm. That's why it was bad. Yeah, now, so, I'm, I'm guessing you might say your top uh, thing to avoid is a non-compete. <laughs> yeah, well, that is my top thing. That was actually my second contract. Um, my first contract is something that I learned the hard way because we don't know these things coming out. My issue was I did have a signing bonus with a forgivable loan. What they do not tell you, what fellows need to know is when that loan is forgiven, you get hit with taxes. So if you're looking at your sign-on bonus as a forgivable loan, um, three years later, when it is forgiven, your IRS taxes that year is going to be higher. So some practices have it written into the contract that if you stay on, they will pay the additional taxes, but it is something to be well aware of that I did not know with my first contract. Um, so those are my top two points of advice that can cost you a lot of money. No non-competes and look to see how your bonuses are being paid off down the line because it is income. Sure. If you, if you want to come to California, we have a non-competes are illegal. Come join us. <laughs> um, we're, we're about out of time. Um, I'll just let uh, Dan Jones will give you the, uh, the privilege of the last uh, top mistake or, or error you see made in that taking a job, signing a contract phase. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's not about the money, it's the fit and making sure that you feel comfortable working with the people that you're going to be working with. Uh, but let me not make my mistake today. I need to thank all the fellows who've helped me get to where I am today and covering for me today. So uh, I think all of us could take a moment and say thanks to all the fellows. Okay. And, and actually, let, there's one question uh, from the attendees that actually I'd like to have uh, uh, anybody answer. Uh, any advice for female surgeons on how to avoid the gender pay gap? I, I will tell you that I, one of my co-fellows actually, um, she ended up taking a job with her, with the place where she did her residency. And she got very lucky in that the department chair who was handling her contract saw it and at the same time saw the contract for a male specialty surgeon coming in at the exact same time as her and saw a very large pay gap. And he actually defended her and went back to, you know, the administration and said, you guys can't, this, you can't do this. This is not appropriate. Um, but how to avoid it? <laughs> I don't know how to avoid it. I just say, be aware of it and be wary of it and use your MGMA data um, to kind of support your claim to what you deserve. Because uh, it's it, when you're coming into a new place, it's really pretty virtually impossible to find out what other people are making and whether or not what they're offering you is equivalent. 
but it is real and uh, gender discrimination in, in healthcare is um, all over the place. I hate to admit it. And it got me in some unexpected ways, um, but just be wary. And that's something that none of us should tolerate, right? So if we identify it, we should all call that out. So, so do, you, do you think it's okay for the, uh, you know? The, uh, and I, I'll tell you, it's. Sorry, I was gonna say, do you, do you think it's okay for the applicant to actually just, just ask, well, you know, can, can I see what the last couple, you know, male, male surgeons you've hired were hired at or, or are at? You can ask it, but they might not show it to you. Um, the other thing, one thing to, that you might do is see if you can find some other female um, surgeons in that organization and the instances have been, because I'll tell you, I'm one of three female surgeons in my healthcare system. Uh, and we have all, we can all laundry list out the episodes of gender discrimination that we've experienced at our, at our health system. And there are certain things that you're willing to accept and certain things you aren't. And I think when you're new and young, like I am, you accept more than you should of that. Um, so ask me again in five years, and I probably would have fought a lot harder against some of what went on um, that I let, I let go by because I was afraid that it would follow me for the rest of my career. Sure. Now, if you get a sense that's going on, isn't that just a clue that's not the place you should You muted yourself. Well, well, I'm just thinking if you had figured that out during the process, it sounds like that's a place that you wouldn't want to be at. For sure. If you can figure it out during the process, um, you know, in, in my case, it's just one thing that added to my most recent attempt to renegotiate my contract that has utterly failed that is making me look, uh, uh, look for another job. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, uh, we're, we're way over time, but it was fantastic conversation. Um, I really want to thank all, all the speakers and panelists. Uh, thank uh, uh, Adrian Dan again for setting up this whole series. And uh, we'll have everybody tune in next month. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone.